Hey scholars, welcome to chapter 9 and we're taking a look at one of the core sustaining principles of the textbook and looking at how are we going to sustain biodiversity but looking at the species approach, so focusing on the species. And the first species we actually talk of is a very, very sad story and, uh, and kind of a depressing one, but it is vital and it's called about the passenger pigeon. Um, the passenger pigeon was a, a species or a variation of pigeon that was hunted to extinction in the uh, by the 1900s. Um, it was they used it at, commercial hunters used it as a stool pigeon, which is kind of like today's version of a decoy. And uh, they basically would sew the eyes. This is kind of gruesome, but since we're in Halloween season, sewing the eyes shut of the stool, the, pe the actual live pigeon, and then sitting it up on the branch. So kind of it couldn't really move. It couldn't see anything, but it was just there. And other pigeons would come in, and then. The hunter would blast the rest of them, but um, just kind of a sad story about the, the pigeon. Um, you can see the last, uh, one of the last remaining like preserved species of passenger pigeon at the Cincinnati Zoo in Ohio. I did get a chance to see that at one time, and here's a picture of it real briefly. There's the, this is actually a photo taken from the Cincinnati. There's a little memorial for the passenger pigeon there, um, and just a sad story, but Looking at this, we're looking at you know, species extinctions too, and our archaeological records show there has been five major mass extinctions. Um, and the question that we're really posed throughout this chapter is that you know are human activities kind of hastening or quickening the process of more extinctions? Um, and so I guess we'll, we'll 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 get your opinion on that throughout this this chapter, and uh, and we'll see what you think. But let's take a look at uh, section 9.1. What do, you, what do you role do humans play in the premature extinction of a species? Kind of going back to the end of that case study there for a quick second. Um, human activities are destroying and degrading biodiversity. Um, we've done this on many of times. There's a couple of the different ones. We're looking at human activities that disturb at least half of the Earth's land service, whether it's filling in wetlands, converting grasslands and forests, forests to croplands uh, or in urban areas. Uh, we've, we've talked about last section, degrading aquatic biodiversity, you know, things that we've done um, or that, that we are doing in the process of. So uh, there's a couple of different examples of degrading biodiversity. Um, extinctions are natural, and that has happened, like our history has said, five major mass extinctions, but sometimes they increase sharply. And one that's just a normal extinction is called background extinction. It's the vocabulary term we use for very low level, continuous, slow extinction, still speciation occurring, but just a low level, very slow moving extinction where there's a few species dying out here and there. Um, the term extinction rate uh, refers to the number of percent and percentage of a species that go extinct within a certain time period, usually in years, and that's another, there's another vocabulary term for you. Uh, mass extinction is where lots of species are becoming extinct at the exact same time, and there's many causes. You know, in, in past history, we thought it was volcanoes or meteors, the dinosaurs. You know, just a couple of examples, or um, at least uh, less theories, anyway. Um, levels of species extinction. There's three major levels. The first one is local extinction, where they're really no longer found in one single area. Um, like for instance, they would no longer be found in Jacksonville, that might be a local extinction. An ecological extinction is there's so few members in, in, of that species that it really can't play its natural niche or role in the ecosystem. And then finally, the third one, which is the worst of all, the biological extinction, where there's, there's no longer found anywhere else on Earth, not in the wild, captivity, it's totally gone from our, uh, from our Earth. Um, some activities, again, some of the ones that, at least terrestrial ones, are habitat destruction and overhunting. And that we really think those two are really speeding the pace up of premature extinctions. Um, and sometimes when we're looking at you know human activities causing, it, we can we we think about this, and this is just the conservative estimates of extinction that really we're losing about almost one percent between zero one and one percent a year. And a lot of this is due to growth of human population. Um, you know the rates are higher where there are more endangered species, tropical forest, coral reefs, wetlands, wetlands, estuaries are being destroyed, those, have, those vital habitats of biodiversity, all those things are contributing to kind of a slow increase in rate of extinction. And all three of these things, because of human population growth, you know, um, these, these certain ecosystems that are high in biodiversity being destroyed, that all leads to what we call, in, as a vocabulary term, the speciation crisis, where really all three of those play a factor into, man, we are increasing our, our death of species or extinction of species on a regular basis. Your book gives you a few examples of some of the sad stories that led to premature extinction due to human activities like the passenger pigeon, which we talked about earlier in the case study, 
the Great Auk, the Dodo, um, the Golden Toad. So those are just a few examples that your book gives us of species that have been uh, or become extinct because of us. This is a graph that just kind of talks about, um, you know, what does it look like? What is what is 0.1 percent, the smallest percent we could get, you know, compared to, you know, and, and, and kind of holding that into accountable for larger groups of organisms like millions of species. So five million, that equals about 5,000 extinct per year. And it takes number of years until one million. Species. So about 200 years it would take. So quite a long time for one million. If you have 4 million species, that 0.1% of that is 14,000 extinct per year. It only takes about 75 year, million years to become uh, for um, until 1 million species are extinct. 5 million uh, years, 0.1% of that is 50,000. It's just kind of giving you some, some inverse rate, basically, of looking at um, number of species existing and having that 0.1% extinction rate applied to that over millions of years. Um, there's two things that we look at when we're, we're, we're classifying organisms, whether they're close to becoming extinct or not, and that is the endangered species. That's There's a difference between endangered and threatened species. The endangered one is the worst of the two, uh, other than extinct is the worst, but has so few individuals that survivors uh, of survivors, uh, species could soon become extinct over all or most of its natural range. Um, a threatened species, uh, a little bit less um, you know, at risk, but still at risk, otherwise known as a vulnerable species, they're still abundant in, in their natural range, but because of their decline numbers and the rate at which their numbers are declining, it's likely to become endangered in the future and possibly extinct. And here is a couple of different examples of endangered species. Um, the grizzly bear, you know, war, Kirtland's warbler, Florida manatee, African elephant, Siberian tiger, golden lion tamarind, um, you know, Utah prairie dog, giant panda, black-footed ferret, blue whale, mountain gorilla, Florida panda, just to, the list goes on, hawksbill sea turtle, all those are uh, endangered species. Um, and that, uh, so there's some characteristics that make species more prone to becoming ecologically and biologically extinct. And the biggest one is that most of them, if you notice, they're larger organisms, they're case-selected species, which means they have low reproductive rates. They usually are specialized in their, in their niche, the, their role they play in the environment. They have a very small distribution. They're only located in a few areas. Um, they feed at high trophic levels, so they're at the top of the food chain. They usually have fixed patterns in which they move, like the hawksbill sea turtle. They're just rare overall, you know, like have certain, you know, different temperature and, and pH and uh, moisture and precipitation, you know, uh, needs that there's very, there's very little place on earth that provide that for them. They might be commercially viable, which means they're, they're prone to poaching. And they're also have either large territories to protect, which means there's less land for more, more, more creatures. So, those are just a few examples of characteristics that really make organisms prone to extinction. All right, percentage of various species threatened with premature extinction. So actually, if you, if I want you to look at this for a second and tell me what you think about it, or at least think about what you're thinking about it. That makes some sense. But looking at this graph, which two uh, or which things stand out to you? And I hope that you saw, as you were thinking there for a second, that most of, this ha most of the ones that are you know, threatened with premature extinction have re really heavily relied on water, which are your fishes and your amphibians, right? 32%, 34%, 51% of which are freshwater species. So really the water is playing a huge impact on the, at least in my mind after looking at this, um, of those premature extinctions. Then mammals follows 25%, reptiles 20, plants 14, and birds 12. I just thought that was kind of an interesting uh, correlation that I made there with, or maybe that you made there. With, uh, with, with that graph. Um, when we're estimating extinction rates, it's really not an easy task. There's so many things that kind of factor into this, and there are three major problems. One, it's very hard to document, hard to document due to the length of time it takes for an organism to actually become extinct. Um, only 1.8 million species are identified, and we don't even identify the rest of them. So then there's lots, I think there's over 20 million, so we are only, only scratched the surface of identifying species. How can we tell if they're even extinct then? They can be going extinct, we haven't even discovered them yet. Um, and literally little is known about the nature and the ecological roles of those species that we've even identified. So those are the three ha biggest problems. Um, it's, it, it's very hard to do so. And plus, we also have a, a species to error relation that we kind of use to predict uh, extinction rates. One of those is that we, with a 90% loss of a habitat, it really causes about 50% of the species in that area to become extinct. So that's just a little mathematical formula that we've used to kind of predict um, what's going to happen in the future as far as um, uh, extinction rates go. And we use mathematical, my, uh, excuse me, mathematical models all the time, which include factors such as population size, trends, changes in habitat, interactions, different genetics, 
to kind of put together what those extinction rates are. But again, so many things coming into play, very hard to get an exact extinction rate down and really know exactly what it is. All right, that brings us to section 9-1.